just kidding. <laughs> Well, welcome back. And for those of you who are out there still eating, come on back in. This is going to be fun. Uh, 15 minutes, it's sort of uh, as fast as you can go kind of a thing. I've got a lot of information to get to you, but what I've got done is, is I put it all in a PowerPoint that you get afterwards, okay? So if we go too fast through some of this stuff, realize that uh, you can also email me at jsmith at numerex.com. I'm the CTO of Numerex. Numerex is a uh, a full play internet company that's been around for about 20 years, public company in the United States, about 100 million in revenues, 200 employees. We have about 2.7 million devices on our network and uh, adding one about every 45 seconds. And we do uh, managed services, so full device, network, and application. But today I'm gonna talk to you about the socialization of machines. And it's really time for our IoT devices to be as clever as Google, as immediate as Twitter, as informative as Wikipedia, as useful as Evernote, as personal as Amazon, and of course, as social as Facebook. You may not realize it, but uh, Google's doing about 30 billion transactions a month from a search standpoint. Twitter's doing about a billion, two billion uh, a month in transaction wise. There's probably 300 billion email messages a month that are sent across the world. So there are a lot of transactions that are happening. So when we talk about 20 to 50 billion devices, we have some infrastructure that has the opportunity to be able to make them social. And in fact, uh, that's what we're gonna talk about today. I've heard that the green button doesn't exactly connect directly to the screen. It connects to a light back there. There we go. So, there are really different types of relationships. You know, you have machine to person, like the Toyota Prius that uh, will, uh, I friended my Prius and now it tells me when it needs to be charged, which is a nice thing for it to do. Uh, you have things like uh, Nike shoes and the little button in my shoe tells me when I need to go take a walk. Uh, the Coke machine, when I walk up to it, tells me that uh, it knows what I had before when I mixed two drinks and so it'll do that for me again. I have a Philips light bulb, Wi-Fi wise, that I can change the mood of the color before I even get home. Uh, my, I, my little button on the refrigerator, Wi-Fi button, I can push and it automatically gets some Evian delivered to the house next week. I have a Nest thermostat that's smart enough to know when I'm home and when I'm not. The glow caps tell me when I'm supposed to take my medicine. This is getting a little crazy, isn't it? The machine to enterprise is a bit conventional these days, but there are connections and relationships between uh, Salesforce.com and the Internet of Things, SAP, Oracle, and IBM also have similar interfaces. And then there's the machine to machine family relationships where devices really are part of a family. They're all very similar. And uh, Swarm, which I have a, a colleague who'll be talking about Swarm in particular in a little bit, uh, mesh networks and predict particularly predictive analytics when you have lots of devices which are similar, which are distributed and disparate ar around the world. Uh, you have the opportunity to be able to take that information. That's a family of devices. And when you have things like uh, power management where they uh, react similarly, they can share information with each other about how in fact to respond to the environment. And then there's machine to machine discovered. And these are discovered relationships between machines and other machines or devices and other devices through the networks. And it hasn't quite happened that much yet. We talked a little bit about it over the last few uh, presentations, and we're going to dive into that in a little bit more detail. So what drives those relationships? Well, the innovations in social networks, we're going to talk a bit about that. And that's a, that's a social networks of people, so how can those be applied to machines? The ease with which machines are now connecting to the network uh, from power, so powerful single chip microprocessor units, low cost and low power wireless transmission, protocols like 6 low pan and co-op and JSON, message delivery mechanisms like MQTT, AMQP, Stomp, and ActiveMQ, semantic web technologies like RDF, OWL, Sparkle, emergence of standard ontologies like the World Wide Web Consortium, and the enthusiasm for linking open data project, which we'll talk about in just a bit. 
machines are people too. Machines can blog, machines can tag, machines can out crowdsource on a wiki, they can have a flash mob, they, they can be antisocial, they can be social, they can purchase, they can tweet, they can query, they can build and destroy trust, they can vote and they can bid. And the social fabric, the social network today is actually quite complex. And my bet is, is that there's a lot of things that we can learn from what's happened over the last five or six years in the social web. And so if you look at all of these different types of com companies, many of them are ones in which have business models that actually work, and you can apply those business models in the social network of people to the social network of machines. So for instance, you're familiar with some of these. So Facebook, a marketplace, allows members to post. And I'll run through them quick. Blogger, it's a blog publishing service. And so you can imagine a machine doing its own blog. Digs, a social network website feature, featuring user submitted web, uh, news stories, brings content together, RSS feeds. We've got lots of devices on our network that do RSS and they, all, they tweet you. They can build a Facebook page around it. And Twitter, of course, is uh, one of the, the largest systems for doing you know, short, little, tiny pieces of information, but gazillions of them, and people can subscribe and publish to it. Does it sound familiar? It's the same kind of a thing that we're talking about, where you've got lots of devices out there that are basically interacting in such a way in real time and be able to show, send short messages to each other. And those are part of the social web. The web 2.0, the web applications enabled users to interact and collaborate with each other, providing power to end users. And YouTube, a billion unique every month, four billion videos every day. That's content. That's a lot of transactions. When the social web meets the semantic web, and we're going to be talking about the semantic web for a second, the semantic web is not a separate web. The semantic web is really a different way of representing information inside of web pages. Think of it a, a, a different type of HTML that actually allows machines to be able to grab that information and do something with it. And if machines can do that, then they can pass that on to other machines, or machines can query that. And so the types of projects that are currently being worked on within the social framework and the semantic web, from a people standpoint, in fact can be applied to machines. So a lot of folks from an uh, innovation standpoint are working in the area of being able to take messages and transmit them uh, to, uh, from devices to databases in many cases or to other devices. These are some of them and some of the ones that are actually a little bit more innovative. And I went ahead and put Numerex right at the top in the middle just so everybody would have that in frame of re reference. That was a kidding. Uh, but to give you an idea, some of these other folks are here today. Uh, PubNub, very interesting uh, concept. There they are over there. Hey guys, really cool deal. And uh, you know, it's really the next evolution of a lot of the transaction processing that needs to occur in real time. And being able to do playback and things like that is fantastic innovation. Uh, the Zively folks, Watt.io just recently announced uh, their platform. So a lot of these platforms are ones in which there's a lot of innovation going within the machine to machine and IoT community. And it's an evolution. This is the evolution of platform as a service. You know, we really started out with apps and then we moved to portals and that was how you just differentiate yourself from the rest of the world to use this portal to be able to look at information and basically do device management and subscription management. And then we moved to platforms and the platforms have the ability not only to do the device management uh, and also subscription management, but it also extended that to be able to do reliable communications through SMS and, and uh, through uh, cellular connectivity, GPRS, and, and uh, also maybe satellite connectivity and Wi-Fi and through hybrid techni techniques there. And so what's the next evolution? Well, the next evolution that's occurring today with some of those folks that I mentioned before are in exchanges where people are starting to exchange information between different platforms or they're the interface or the glue in between those. And really, so what's the next after that? It's really, I think, semantic exchanges. And so what's the difference between web one, web two, web three? Well, I'll let you refer back to this chart, but if you zoom down to the bottom on web three, you really have things like the semantic web, this web of information that machines can then read. And in order for machines to read it, you need an ontology and you need a, a dictionary, so to speak. And so uh, programs like 
uh, RD, uh, RDF or, or protocols like RDF and, and OWL and things like that are ones that you need to become familiar with in the same way that you're familiar with HTML. So you understand what this language is that these, these machines are going to speak to other through uh, when uh, information is published uh, to a website. And machines also in this relationship uh, have different ways that they communicate. And sometimes they communicate in a hierarchy uh, where there's coordination. Uh, sometimes they, 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 they operate in a group without hierarchy. And so that's really cooperation. And sometimes they just operate almost chaotically, but they operate through the same ground rules. And there's emergent behavior there. And in this particular case, I use this example because in my PhD dissertation a gazillion years ago, it's, it's in uh, artificial intelligence and robotics, I used ant colony optimization. It was actually a mimicking of the way ants pass pheromones in order to do optimization on how you move a robotic arm and how you fly an autonomous vehicle. Those same types of techniques are used to solve this traveling salesman problem from a scheduling standpoint within a lot of systems that are built today. And there are other algorithms like that that, that uh, have the capability to be able to applied. And they're applied through the relationship of a lot of these uh, types of devices. And so flocks of birds are another relationship. Each bird, really, there's no head bird. You know, the, the, they're, they're moving in a flock and they're operating under the ground rules of information that they only have and their nearest neighbors. In the same way, machines are going to be able to process. But be careful because you can have systems that go a little bit wobbly when that happens, particularly if they have large numbers of devices in them. But there are many positive things that can happen. This is an MIT project, which is called Sea Swarm. If you remember, we had some serious problems from an oil leakage standpoint in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is one of the ways in order to uh, attack that problem. It's, it's a swarm of devices which have the ability to be able to absorb oil. And so you put, put thousands of these out there and they actually surround the oil. And they, they, they have emergent behavior of this surrounding and be able to close it in a lot like the herding behavior that you find in animals. So what types of use cases uh, do we need to think about? Uh, and, and, and how do they evolve? Because currently we're in a pretty nascent stage of everything. Uh, and, and so they'll evolve through uh, uh, a, a series of, of, of additions of capability and algorithms. And so video stream to recorder and monitoring, pretty common off the shelf security. Multiple coordinated video cameras with automatic tracking where you walk into a building and it sees you and it automatically tracks you around. Cameras that are coordinated with motion detectors and door sensors. So now you see it's, it's, it's heterogeneous information, different other types of sensors that are coming in to be able to communicate between these different machines. And then the last one is more of emergent behavior where you have a hybrid security system with discovery. So a camera can actually find a sensor which is a motion sensor or a door sensor that's within its same vicinity and can automatically discover that and the, the resources that it has and subscribe to those resources and then publish information back to that. And now you have a coordinated effect of lots of different disparate sensors. Another example is smart buildings. In the same way, you have separate tenant and security thermostats today. Uh, then you have a centralized hierarchical sort of security and energy management system that may manage the building. And then you have integrated energy and management and security. So you know your motion uh, sensors that go in can actually tell you to turn on the air conditioner, but only at certain times. And then you have integrated energy and security with predict predictive analytics. Smart traffic the same way. Time traffic signals go to multiple coordinated signals with centralized monitoring, go to traffic flow sensors, signage, and ramp signaling from an integrated hybrid sort of approach, and then hybrid traffic system with discovery, learning, and autonomous systems. So, but be careful because uh, there, there are also some applications that have to do with not just this more hierarchical uh, 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 overview type thing, but there are some things that can happen even on a mesh basis between devices without going to a centralized information. And the example on the left is uh, one of the projects that I did where we have uh, uh, some systems that are deployed where they know the rules. They know what types of chemicals can't be near other types of chemicals. They actually know the regulations and they'll yell at you if you get too close to something that it has an interaction with. Now that's an interesting little dialogue that's going between machines uh, that, are, that are basically a, 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 a sensor, and in this case it's just a location-based system that you've pre-programmed in, what the type 
of uh, chemical is in the drum. And then screams, you know, those are sort of whispers to each other, they're screams. So it turns out that we did a project with a bunch of, uh, of pallets, plastic pallets, and we have an injection molded uh, device that goes in there for several years and reports back the location of the pallets. And what we found out was that pallets go to nefarious places and then they disappear, which is kind of weird if you think about it. And, and, and then you go visit one of those places because we happen to have the GPS coordinates and to see where they disappeared. And it's basically a little grind shop, right? And so they're basically taking the pallets, they're grinding up, and they're selling the plastic pallets to somebody else, okay? So the, and that screams, right? And so what I did was pre reprogrammed into those pallets the capability for it to know when it started vibrating like crazy, okay? That was probably when it was getting ground up, and now it screams and says, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm getting killed here. <laughs> Semantics at uh, different layers of IoT. I'm going to uh, uh, skip over that a little bit quickly. Uh, the, the LOD project, this is a semantic network of, of systems that are currently deployed. It's growing like crazy where folks are actually deploying uh, RDF and OWL if, that you can go in from a machine standpoint and go through and find the information that's actually inside of that. I, I highly recommend that you take a look at that project. And because of from that, what you can do is semantic mashups. And it's semantic mashups that was described earlier that, 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 that Matt was talking about, where you actually take this information from a machine standpoint and be able to create some additional value. The machine itself can go out and query things like location of, uh, of, of sensors that uh, know where, when it's rained in order to know whether it's supposed to turn on the sprinklers or not. And then you interlink those communities to be able to do optimization. One of the other speakers earlier talked about the, the ability from an energy management standpoint to sort of compare yourself to other folks. Well, what if, you, what if it was quiet? What, what if your thermostat compared itself to other people and learned what the processes were for being able to optimize energy inside your home? So this, this evolution that's occurring is from web 1.0 to web 2.0 to 3.0 to eventually 4, where you have really a semantic web of Internet of Things and people. And, and th then there's the, the project Semantically Interlinked Online Communities. This is the social network project of which there needs to be one relative to machines. Take a look at it. And the Open Geospatial Consortium is a project which is around this uh, social uh, sort of networking of machine data that you ought to take a look at because really within this project you have this problem of these siloed applications with information of which you want to overcome that. You really have lots of different services that, uh, that you can deploy and this opportunity for standards hasn't really evolved yet. So what you need to do is basically create uh, a, 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 a ontology that allows people to speak to each other not through a centralized hub, but may, maybe through the capability to just do uh, publish and subscription. And so there's a vision, sensors will be web accessible, discoverable, self-describing to humans, and observations will be easily accessible. The standardized web service will be used, capable of real-time mining of observations. These are by machines, not by people. And then you'll have issuing alerts and, and from those observations, the software will be on-demand geolocation capable and uh, with common sense web interfaces and the sensors and machines will be able to act on their own. So what are my conclusions? Well, currently M2M -M IoT is in a nascent stage, much like Web 1.0. Most work to this point has been in reliable message transport and reporting. The social web, Web 2.0, will only apply to people, to not, not only apply to people, to machines, but enterprise to machine, family to machines, where there's a well-defined ontology and domain-specific communications protocol. Because machines don't yet have the ability to work with unstructured data. So as social networking and semantic network innovations are applied to the Internet of Things, an inflection is going to occur. And that's the network effect. And we're going to see that network effect in the same way that we've seen the network effect on the social interactions and the social network of Web 2.0 with people. So platform as a service players, take note. You'd be well served to incorporate these types of innovations into your services, publish them, and then encourage they be adopted by device manufacturers and M2M IoT systems integrators. Thank you very much.